Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you again for joining us. Uh, my name is Joel Nolette. I am on the executive committee of the Federal Society's Administrative Law and Regulation Practice Group, and I am uh, also involved with the Article I initiative of the Federal Society. While the Supreme Court's landmark 1904 decision in Chevron versus Natural Resources Defense Council was once hailed as a triumph of judicial restraint, the doctrine has come under fire as of late. Calls for reform and even wholesale abrogation of the doctrine have come from prominent figures in all three branches of government. But is a world without Chevron desirable? If the doctrine is abandoned or overhauled, what would that mean for Congress? Would a renovation of Chevron help the first branch reclaim its lawmaking prerogatives? Or would jettisoning the doctrine hinder Congress's work? The experts on the panel here this afternoon will explore these and other questions regarding Chevron and the role of Congress. Here to introduce these experts and guide this discussion, playing equal parts moderator and panelist, is Professor Jennifer Mascott. <laughs> professor Mascott is an assistant professor of law at the Antonin Scalia Law School. She is also a public member of the Administrative Conference of the United States and a vice chair of the Judicial Review and Supreme Court Committee within the ABA's section of administrative law and regulatory practice. Among her many credentials, Professor Mascott is a former law clerk to Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas and to then judge Brett M. Kavanaugh while he was on the DC Circuit. Professor Mascott writes in the areas of administrative and constitutional law and the separation of powers, and her works have appeared on numerous outlets, including the pages of the Supreme Court Reporter. Before embarking on her legal career, Professor Mascott worked as a staffer here on Capitol Hill, holding various positions, including press secretary to former Congressman Eric Cantor and former Congresswoman Ann Northup. Without further ado, Professor Mascott. Well, thanks so much, Joel, and thanks to the Article I Initiative of the Federalist Society for hosting this important panel discussion today on the doctrine of Chevron deference. As many of you know, the doctrine of Chevron deference is based on a decision that the Supreme Court issued in 1984 upholding Reagan-era action by the Environmental Protection Agency. But over the past several decades, the case has come to stand for the broad proposition that when a statute gives unclear or broad instructions to an administrative agency, courts should defer to the agency's interpretation of how to carry out those statutory commands. So in other words, under Chevron, as long as an agency's interpretation fits reasonably within a statute, courts should defer to the agency action as lawful. And so instead of determining on a clean slate for themselves whether an agency has properly interpreted its legal authority under a statute, courts put kind of a thumb on a scale in favor of the agency's own interpretation under Chevron. And so as Congress over the years has delegated more and more authority to agencies in more and more broadly worded statutes, one question that comes up is whether Chevron deference results in too much discretion being handed over to agencies. Perhaps so much discretion that the public really no longer has fair notice under a given statute what actions an agency might take with the authority that it's been given by Congress. And so today to talk about some of these issues and the possible future of Chevron deference under the current Supreme Court, we've got a great panel of very qualified experts. And so what I'm gonna do is introduce the panelists uh, as a group and then they will each take about eight minutes to speak They'll have some discussion amongst themselves, and then we'll open it up to audience questions. So first, I'm delighted to say we've got Professor Kristen Hickman. She's the distinguished McKnight U uh, University professor and Harlan Albert Rogers Professor in Law at the University of Minnesota Law School. She's a leading authority in the areas of tax administration and administrative law. She co-authors the Administrative Law Treatise and a leading administrative law casebook with Professor Dick Pierce. And she's written extensively about Chevron deference, most recently publishing an article on the inevitability of Chevron's role within the modern administrative state. Then we'll hear from Mark Chenoweth, he's the <laughs> Executive Director and General Counsel of the New Civil Liberties Alliance, which is led by Professor Philip Hamburger. Mark's work within every branch of government. He served as the first Chief of Staff to then Congressman <laughs> Mike Pompeo. He was legal counsel to Commissioner Ann Northup at the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission. He was an attorney advisor in the Office of Legal Policy at the Department of Justice and a law clerk for Judge Boggs on the Sixth Circuit. He works on issues related to deference doctrines and administrative law in his current role at the NCLA and most recently worked on a brief in the Kaiser case in which the Supreme Court this term has taken up the question of whether to overrule our deference, which is a closely related cousin of Chevron deference, which we're talking about today. 
Then we'll have David Doniger, who's the Senior Strategic Director of the Climate and Clean Energy Program at the National Resources Defense Council. He served on both the White House Council on Environmental Quality and at the EPA in a number of different capacities in the 1990s. He works extensively in his current role at the NRDC on issues related to the Clean Air Act. He was involved in helping to litigate the Chevron case itself, and today we'll talk about the role that Chevron deference plays in enabling administrative agencies to act more quickly and efficiently in regulating. And then we'll close out the panel discussion with Professor David Schoenbrod, trustee <coughs> professor of law at the NYU Law School. He's a prolific author. His most recent book is DC Confidential, Inside the Five Tricks of Washington, which he published in 2017 with four words by both Governor Howard Dean and Senator Mike Lee. He co-leads a program looking at environmental law policies for the 21st century at NYU Law School, regularly contributes to publications like the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, and he's written about the implications of the Chevron Doctrine for accountability and the delegation of power from Congress to administrative agencies. So with that, we'll get started with Professor Hickman. Thanks, Jen. Um, so I have to start off with a disclaimer. I'm currently serving as a special advisor to the administrator of OIRA uh, as, on a part-time capacity, and so consequently, I have to say that I'm here today not in that capacity. I'm here in my professorial capacity, um, and nothing I have to say in any way, shape, or form represents the views of OIRA, OMB, the Executive Office of the President, or the federal government. This is just me talking. Um, so I think that I'm on this panel today, actually, because lately I've been perceived as a Chevron defender. Um, it's an ironic position for me because when I started my career, uh, I started with an article called Chevron's Domain, in which Tom Merrill and I argued that courts had applied Chevron too expansively and that Chevron's reach should be limited in scope. So I feel like I've sort of done a little bit of a flip, or maybe it's just time moving past me. But I'm a longtime and staunch believer in a robust step zero as well as a robust step one and a robust step two that includes elements of state farm analysis. Uh, and by the time you get through all of that, uh, I guess I don't have a problem with deference. Um, but despite all of that, I still think Chevron has an important role to play in our jurisprudence as a standard of review and as a framework for analysis, including a command of deference once an interpretation has run the gauntlet of robust inquiries at step, Chevron steps zero, one, and two. And I think that the effort to overturn Chevron is a gigantic red hair that's distracting us from much more consequential legislative efforts, in, uh, both in terms of regulatory reform and simply drafting better statutes where Congress makes more decisions than it delegates to administrative agencies. So I guess, to the extent that I still see a role for Chevron in our current scheme, that makes me a Chevron defender. Um, so in these opening remarks, I want to make three interrelated points. First, in considering whether we're going to overturn Chevron, we have to think critically about what we're trying to accomplish. And here, I think we have two distinct groups of people that aren't necessarily recognizing or conversing with one another. Many people who talk about overturning Chevron simply want to replace it with what they perceive as some less deferential standard of review, like Skidmore, or perhaps a robust application of traditional tools of statutory interpretation combined with State Farm. Um, as Nick Bednar and I documented pretty extensively in our 2017 Chevron's Inevitability article, if that's all you want to do, then you're really just rearranging the deck chairs. Depending upon the judge or justice, Chevron analysis already looks a lot like Skidmore or like a robust effort at statutory interpretation combined with State Farm. Plenty of judges evaluate Skidmore factors like longevity and consistency in applying Chevron analysis. See Justice Breyer in Barnhart versus Walton or his concurring opinion in City of Arlington. Plenty of judges and justices believe in a robust step one inquiry that incorporates a wide variety of tools in the statutory interpretation toolbox. See, for example, Justice Scalia's 1989 Duke Law Journal article, or more recently, Justice Kavanaugh's Harvard Law Review article, or Judge Kethledge's Vanderbilt Law Review piece. See also, for example, Food and Drug Administration versus Brown and Williamson Tobacco from two 
2000, wherein Justice O'Connor engaged an extremely robust Chevron Step 1 analysis to find the meaning of the statute clear, or more recently, in the several opinions in, and I'm going to butcher this, uh, Scalaba v. Cuellar uh, in 2014, where six justices in three separate concurring opinions uh, concurring and dissenting opinions, absolutely lambasted Justice Kagan's plurality opinion for failing to make more of an effort to evaluate statutory interpretation at Chevron state, step one using traditional tools of statutory interpretation. Plenty of judges believe in blending State Farm into the analysis. See Justice Kennedy in Encino Motor Cars or Justice Scalia in Michigan versus EPA. The D.C. Circuit has been blending Chevron and State Farm analysis since at least the 1990s. Sure, some judges would find ambiguity in a stop sign and side with the agency with too little independent inquiry. But if a judge is so inclined, then the judge is going to defer no matter what the standard of review is. Overturning Chevron is simply going to change the language that a judge uses when they defer, which leads to my second point. The other group of Chevron opponents want to get rid of judicial deference entirely and have the courts resolve all questions of statutory interpretation de novo. Chevron as applied, in my view at least, is not entirely inconsistent with de novo review, as Chevron step one contemplates utilizing traditional tools of statutory interpretation to evaluate statutory meaning, and you're only supposed to go on to Chevron step two and think about deference if you've gone through that exercise and concluded that you can't discern a clear meaning of the statute. Um, but as Justice Scalia observed on more than one occasion, and here I paraphrase, sometimes you apply all the traditional tools in the statutory interpretation toolbox, and you still end up without a clear answer regarding statutory meaning. So when a judge gets to that point, what is she supposed to do? At that point, the choice is between the competing alternatives, and the competing alternatives, that choice is really all about policy. So Chevron step two would say, well, at that point, if you have an interpretation from an administering agency, and that interpretation seems reasonable, and here again, you can apply both tools of statutory interpretation and State Farm to evaluate reasonableness, then go ahead and defer to the agency that has the expertise and that Congress has thus set up to make these sorts of choices. Which leads me to my final point which is that Congress has set up agencies to resolve precisely these sorts of policy questions. As the Supreme Court said in United States versus Mead Corp in 2001, Chevron only applies when Congress has given the agencies the power to act with the force of law and the agencies have exercised that power. In other words, you only get Chevron deference when Congress has delegated policymaking discretion to agencies, which Congress does all the time. Uh, <clears throat> someone this morning observed uh, or made the suggestion that Sh Chevron encouraged more rulemaking. That's not exactly quite accurate. The rise in rulemaking started in the 1960s and the 1970s, before Chevron, with academics pushing rulemaking as a superior vehicle for agency decision making, and with Congress enacting statutes with more and more expansive grants of rulemaking power. Regulatory legislation consistently sp identifies specific issues for agencies to address through rulemaking. Uh, regulatory legislation consistently includes terms that are underdefined or undefined, and provisions that interact with one another in various ways that, when applied, give rise to questions that traditional tools of interpretation alone simply cannot resolve. Regulatory legislation consistently uses words and phrases like necessary or requisite or fair and equitable or feasible and prudent or in the public interest that aren't completely unconstrained but nevertheless contain lots of latitude for agency policy making. Regulatory legislation consistently includes provision after provision that perhaps contains some amount of detail, 
but then ends with a subsection telling the administering agency to adopt rules and regulations as needed to elaborate the parameters of that provision and its interaction with other provisions. Regulatory legislation consistently includes a general grant of rulemaking power authorizing administering agencies to adopt rules and regulations as needed to effectuate legislative goals. Some of these grants of, of rulemaking power are broader than others, but they all assume that statutory text, history, and purpose alone will not resolve all of the questions that will arise. And these rulemaking grants designate the administering agency as the body to make the policy choices represented by those gaps. To the extent that these myriad delegations of policymaking discretion yield questions that cannot be resolved by traditional tools of statutory interpretation, most judges are not all that eager to step up and make the policy choices themselves. Chevron gives them a language to say, this is really a question of policy choice, not one of traditional statutory interpretation, and thus gives judges the ability to be transparent in their decision making. Eliminating Chevron won't change the outcome in those cases. Eliminating Chevron will merely prompt judges to use different language, to hide behind more tenuous applications of traditional tools or behind observations regarding longe uh, longevity and consistency or whatever. Um, I prefer the transparency in judicial decision making that Chevron affords. To sum up, our problem isn't too much Chevron. Our problem is too much delegation. And even if, as Sally Katzen mentioned this morning, some technical or scientific issues really should be left to agency experts, I still would maintain that there are lots of questions that Congress has delegated to agencies at present that it could resolve for itself, but simply chooses not to. And even if Congress wants to specify a particular issue that it wants an agency to utilize its technical expertise to resolve, Congress does not have to give agencies general authority to adopt rules and regulations as needed to effectuate statutes. So long as Congress continues to delegate so much power to agencies, it shouldn't expect the judiciary to step outside of its traditional role to pick up that slack. Thank you. Let me begin by thanking the Federalist Society for uh, this invitation uh, and thanking Jen for both uh, the introduction and for moderating uh, today's panel. I think it's particularly appropriate that we're discussing this subject on Ronald Reagan's birthday, uh, not just because he was a president in 1984 when Chevron came down, but also because he was famously not a big fan of the administrative state. Uh, let, me, let me say that I don't think a world without Chevron is a scary prospect uh, in the least, and, and let me give you a few reasons why uh, that's the case. First of all, a return to pre-1984 doctrine in administrative law would not prevent federal agencies from regulating. At lunch, Mr. Uh, Barone asked whether Congress could do the regulating in place of the agencies, and respectfully, I think that that is the wrong question. It's not, if Chevron went away, it's not that Congress would be doing the regulating instead of the federal agencies. It's just that when the federal agencies wrote regulations and they went up to federal courts to be reviewed, the federal courts wouldn't be deferring to those. They would be deciding for themselves with their independent judgment whether those regulations in fact comported with the, the authorizing statute. So it's not that Congress would supplant, uh, would be doing anything different than what it's doing now unless we want to talk about the delegation problem, which uh, I would agree with you on that. Uh, secondly, I just want to point out that California and 17 other states do not follow Chevron-style doctrines today. And I don't know if you've noticed, but California does not seem to have any problems regulating. They pass lots of regulations. Uh, and so I think that the idea that somehow a Chevron would be uh, anti-regulatory or deregulatory is, is miscast. I think that, that that's not, again, the right question to ask. But I, but I wanted to share with you an, an insight from the chairman of the uh, Board of Advisors at the New Civil Liberties Alliance, who is Janice Rogers Brown, the former uh, DC Circuit uh, Court Judge. And you may know uh, that Judge Brown was a justice on the California Supreme Court before coming to the DC Circuit. And what she told me, which I thought was very interesting, and I don't think she would mind if I shared this with you, mm -hmm. is that she was shocked to discover this Chevron doctrine when she got to the DC Circuit because she was used to, as a justice on the California Supreme Court, 
deciding independently as a judge whether the regulations before the court in fact comported with the statutes that the legislature of California had written. And when she got to the DC circuit, that wasn't the job of a federal judge in our system. Instead, the job was to see if there was ambiguity or not, and if there was ambiguity, not to then provide your own independent judgment about the best reading of that provision, but rather to defer to the agency. And that's a very different system, and it does, it does matter whether we're following that sort of system uh, or not. In terms of trends that are happening at the state level, I'm pleased to report that four states abandoned state-level Chevron doctrines in 2018 alone. Arizona, Mississippi, Wisconsin, and Florida all set aside state-level versions uh, of Chevron deference. And they did it, interestingly, in different ways. Arizona did it by statute. Mississippi and Wisconsin both did it by state Supreme Court decision. And Florida did it by referendum. But all of these states joined uh, what I think of as a Chevron revolt at the state level uh, against uh, the doctrine uh, of Chevron. And why revolt, you might say, what, what's so bad about Chevron? Well, what I would like to suggest is that the world that the Constitution gives us is a world without Chevron. And there are two major constitutional objections uh, to the Chevron doctrine that I want to put in front of the audience today. First, Article 3 puts the independent judges in charge of saying what the law is, as Chief Justice Marshall famously put it. Article 3 judges have a duty to provide independent judgment. And if a judge is deferring to something that someone in the executive branch has said about the law, that judge is not providing independent judgment. That's why Article 3 goes to great lengths to protect the independence of the judi judiciary from other branches. The salaries can't be reduced. The, they have lifetime tenure, et cetera. These are very important things that are put into the Constitution to protect the independence of the judges, and Chevron deference takes it away. If Article III judges defer to the interpretation of the administrative agencies, they're abnegating their duty, they're violating their duty to provide their own independent judgment, and that creates a second constitutional problem. The Due Process Clause guarantees litigants that they will not be deprived of life liberty, or property without due process of law. If a judge defers to a government litigant, the other person in that courtroom is being deprived of the due process of law. Imagine for yourselves, imagine that either you're being sued by a federal administrative agency or that you are suing a federal administrative agency and you're appearing in front of a federal judge and the judge looks at, at the arguments that you're making and looks at the arguments that the federal agency is making and suppose that that judge even thinks that you have the better argument. Your interpretation of the law is better than the one that the federal agency came up with. Does that mean you win? No, it doesn't. Because as long as the interpretation that the federal agency came up with is reasonable and there's ambiguity in the statute, you lose, even if you have the better argument. <laughs> that is a deprivation of the due process of law. And it's a violation of the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution of the United States. Even if the government isn't a litigant, but the judge defers to, say, a government amicus brief from the other side. I would argue that that's a due process violation as well. You, as a litigant in a federal courtroom, have a right to due process. That means that the independence of that judge shouldn't be deferring to anyone. Now, they can treat that amicus brief as persuasive on its own power. It can even say, hey, there's some special expertise here that makes this brief more persuasive than it might otherwise be. But the judge can't defer to that decision without depriving the litigants before that judge uh, of due process. So now that I've made these arguments, maybe you can understand uh, why an organization called the New Civil Liberties Alliance uh, cares about something like Chevron uh, deference. It's a serious problem. It's something that the, that the justices of the Supreme Court have created for themselves. It's a problem that they need to fix. They have forced all of the other judges in the federal judiciary to depart from their Article III duty to provide independent judgment, and they have been violating the due process of litigants in federal courts since 1984, and it needs to stop. The good news is that it appears that the current Supreme Court is taking these sorts of arguments seriously. Uh, the current Supreme Court granted, as Jen referred to it, uh, granted a, a case earlier uh, this term, uh, Kaiser v. Wilkie, it's K-I-S-O-R, and in that case, the justices are considering uh, what to, whether or not to overturn our deference. As you may know, whereas Chevron deference involves judges deferring to uh, the statutory interpretations that agencies come up with, our deference involves 
judges deferring to the interpretations of agencies' own regulations. I think that's the first step in repealing Chevron, is to do away with uh, our deference, and I hope that the justices uh, will do that uh, this term. Be happy to talk about that more uh, in the question and answer session uh, if there are any questions uh, about that. Uh, I also just wanted to finish by uh, letting people know uh, that uh, I have copies of Philip Hamburger's book, The Administrative Threat, uh, which is, uh, this is sort of the Cliff's Notes to his 2014 tome. He calls it his doorstop. Uh, and if you're interested in this topic and you give me a, a business card, I would be happy to send you a copy of uh, Philip's book. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. David? <clears throat> Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here on this topic. Um, and uh, as you mentioned, I um, have the, had the unlikely experience as about a 33-year-old of handling a what should have been an ordinary, normal administrative law case um, uh, involving a change in EPA regulations, uh, and uh, it turned into the Chevron Doctrine. Um, the uh, um, I think I'd like to make several points about this. One is that what's involved here is deeply connected <clears throat> to whether, to how legislation. Uh, does or doesn't happen these days, or over the course of the last 40 years. <clears throat> Let me start by noting that um, the Clean Air Act um, and many other statutes of that kind was adopted not just to address a, um, a, a very specific set of problems which were uh, in front of the Congress at the time and um, you know, thoroughly understood and, and hashed out and thus uh, 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 fit or uh, ripe for the Congress to make the exact decisions, in, in effect, to make the regulatory decisions. But the drafters of the Clean Air Act saw that the uh, air pollution problem would manifest itself in all sorts of new ways as science unfolded, as um, uh, uh, as, as things progressed, and they just made a deliberate decision to equip the Environmental Protection Agency with the tools to respond when science showed that something was dangerous, hadn't been, hadn't been known before, uh, and to act without having to come back for Congress to, for, for permission slip. Now, <clears throat> if you... Uh, Imagine a world in which every single regulatory decision, I'm making a, uh, an extreme argument, but you can see it in stages, um, ha you had to go back to Congress for advance permission or for post hoc approval, um, you would find an enormous amount of um, uh, friction in the system and, and a slowness or maybe even an inability to address problems, certainly not in a, in a timely way. Even the regulatory state doesn't deal with things, from my point of view, in a timely way. And um, uh, you would grind uh, the ability of a modern government to respond to the complex modern problems, complex problems of a modern economy and a modern society to a standstill. Also, those decisions would become even more politicized than some of you may think they, they are when done by agencies uh, because uh, congressmen and senators don't have the staff and don't spend the time and don't have the knowledge to know anything about uh, in, in any detail how um, a particular pollutant endangers our health or how a particular control technology works or how much things really cost. And uh, they would be making decisions based on uh, electrical considerations or campaign finance considerations. Add to all this the um, uh, general uh, running down of the ability to legislate uh, so that you have a Congress uh, these days that has trouble naming post offices uh, and manages something important, for example, the criminal justice reform, only once every few years. Um, uh, basically, you're, this is a recipe for, at, at a minimum, having our 
governmental capacity fall behind uh, and further and further behind the ability to keep up with a modern world and to deal with the problems of a modern world. So on Chevron itself, um, might surprise you to learn that NRDC lost the Chevron case. <laughs> uh, we advanced in that case the, the view that the statute was in fact unambiguous, was clear in what Congress was setting out to do in the regulatory provision involved, the statutory definitional terms, all the, legis all this, uh, the contextual and structural uh, analysis, the legislative history, all uh, uh, was on our side. The government's position was a very broad and deeply uh, intoned voice, uh, uh, we think that the statute, it was a delegation to resolve competing considerations and uh, we want it to, have to be upheld in the way we have resolved those competing considerations. Actually, the statute in a proper step one analysis would have, the ruling should have been in our favor. It would then have been up to Congress to decide whether they liked the policy that they had enacted before and change it. Um, but, um, uh, how has this worked out subsequently? Well, um, we've had kind of a laboratory since then. Republican administrations, Democratic administrations, uh, administrations that disfavored uh, air pollution control, environmental policy, administrations that were quite um, uh, bullish on, uh, <laughs> on, uh, uh, on, in, on action in that area. And the deference doctrines uh, should work neutrally um, uh, regardless of the inclinations and tendencies of the incumbent administration. I think it's quite um, telling that the big attack on Chevron occurred during the Obama administration, all the regulatory reform proposals to replace uh, Chevron deference with de novo review, and suddenly when uh, the current president was elected, that legislation uh, lost its proponents because the um, uh, the present administration uh, will have trouble uh, with many of its regulatory rollbacks, uh, certainly under a de novo standard, but I would argue even under the Chevron standard because the first step really is to figure out whether the law has clearly uh, dictated something different than what the administration is trying to do. Um, even before you get to the question of uh, uh, ambiguity and deference and, and, and whether the position of the administration is reasonable. I, in the end, I, I subscribe to, the, to, to, to Professor Hickman's view that um, the problem is inherently there. Uh, the solution is inherently the same. There has to be some degree of deference to agencies or some degree of leeway accorded agencies in the interpretation of statutes. Otherwise, the American government can't keep up with the modern world. And the responsibility of judges is to be honest in the uh, implementation of those tests. Uh, I find that some, uh, that since then, um, uh, NRDC's found itself on the, on the losing side of cases where the statute really is not uh, explicit, and yet a, a judge insists that it is. Uh, uh, and we also have trouble when statutes are ambiguous. Uh, obviously, we, and, and as well as business litigants, have trouble overcoming the, um, the deference that's accorded to administrative agencies. But if you apply this principle, principle of Chevron neutrally, it should basically work for both uh, uh, you know, in both in times of active government and, and, uh, and, and regressive government. So um, I wouldn't change it. The one thing I definitely would not do is uh, what Judge Kavanaugh indicated in uh, his dissent in the, uh, to, it was a dissent to the denial of a hearing on bank in the net neutrality litigation several years ago in which he articulated a doctrine that I find really extreme, one that Chevron is okay for small questions, 
and the deference ruling, uh, the ambiguity, uh, the, the search for ambiguity or clarity, and then the deference if there is ambiguity should proceed as it is for small questions. But for major issues, which he defines as anything of um, economic importance or political importance, then you should flip the, the uh, matter around and an ambiguous statute should be ruled to be uh, basically a failure to legislate. There should be not only uh, uh, no deference given, but the judges should uh, rule that an ambiguous statute uh, can't be given effect. Uh, send it back to Congress for a rework. Um, that is a major uh, assertion of um, uh, if, if it were ever to command five votes on the Supreme Court, a major reassertion of the non-delegation doctrine, and I think would have the uh, run the risks, uh, as I said, of paralyzing the government's ability to deal with problems in any timely way, and it would put the judges in the position, as they were perhaps early in the New Deal, of just um, becoming a political branch on their own with their own views uh, to frustrate um, legislation they don't like simply by declaring it ambiguous and thus a failure. Great, thank so, you. So there we are. Thank you. Thank you, David Doniger, and then David Schoenrud. Thank you very much. Um, I have a slideshow here, and I think the, the easy way of advancing the slides is when I stick my finger in the air, advance, okay? <laughs> Good, okay. So you know, before Chevron, courts did defer in statutory interpretations to agencies to some extent. Since Chevron, more. Okay? Now, Chevron came after Congress began to delegate to agencies in a new way. Instead of uh, enacting rules regulating polluters itself, or giving agencies broad discretion about how they should <coughs> enact the, uh, promulgate the rules regulating uh, polluters. What Congress did is it regulated the agencies. In the Clean Air Act, it said, okay, agency must protect, issue rules sufficient to protect public health by a deadline, and it's up to the court to enforce that order, okay? And that was great for Congress because Congress got the credit for protecting health, but the blame for the cost of compliance and for the failures to protect health fell on the agency because it was the one who was doing the acting, okay? So politically profitable was this business of Congress issuing orders to agencies that in the 1990 version of the Clean Air Act, the words, the administrator shall, appears 940 times. And these are not just one-off orders. Many of them have to be repeated many, many times per year. Okay? Such statutes were, however, bad for judges because these orders that the judges were charged with enforcing were often murky. I mean, for example, here's an example of the kind of order that's there. The Clean Air Act orders the judges to require the EPA, to require the states that new or modified stationary sources must meet tough standards of performance, okay? Now, I, so the, the key words there are new or <laughs> modified stationary source. What does that mean, okay? Now, as a young NRDC attorney, you know, as little, David is now. older than me. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Nine years older. Uh, I was there before David, and I remember reading the Clean Air Act and the legislative history in totality in the early 1970s. What stationary source meant was perfectly clear to me. I never, ever would have dreamed that that was a matter to be delegated to, to the agency. Okay? So I think David had the better argument as to the result in that case if what you're talking about is statutory intent, and you think that what courts are supposed to do is to further statutory intent. Now, there was an argument that that wasn't the best public policy, but that's not for the court, okay? So, but the, the problem for the court, though, was that it had to come up with a definition of stationary source. Now, if you're thinking about a big factory with one smokestack, that's clear, 
Okay? But what about an environment like this, which is in the process of being changed all the time? What type of rule decision is the court going to come up with? That's a toughie. So you could see why the courts wanted to get off the hot seat. Okay. So that's, I think, where Chevron came from. Now, the argument over Chevron is often uh, whether the buck should stop with the agency or with the courts. I'm with Kristen Hickman in thinking that really the buck ought to stop with Congress. At least that's what I think. I mean, that's what I, what I think the issue is. Um, because as <laughs> Federalist 75 says, the job of Congress is to prescribe rules for the regulation of society. And that would make members of Congress responsible for the consequences, which would give us a degree of the consent of the governed, so the governed are controlling the governors. Okay? But of course, Congress prefers to outsource the responsibility to the agencies, and that gives us, because it ducks responsibility, we often get irresponsible legislation. Uh, for example, uh, the Clean Air Act now provides a ridiculously complicated way of regulating the most deadly air pollutants, ozone and particulate matter. Bill Peterson and I uh, wrote an article in the Environmental Reporter. Where is the next one, please? Where we argued that if Congress were responsible, it would likely adopt a much simpler, more efficient, more cost-effective way of regulating these pollutants that would cut them sufficiently <laughs> as to add three months to the life of the average American. That's you, that's your children. Okay. That's the cost of this buck passing, I think. Now the problem is that the Supreme Court cannot fully enforce the constitutional norm that Congress enact, enacts the rules of conduct because in modern times there's just too many rules, as David was talking about. So, um, so what could the court do? Um, but what the court has, has done is it's fudged, it's fudged the distinction, the norm, and the impediment to the full enforcement of the norm by coming up with this murky standard called intelligible principle, which is so vacuous the court finds it can't enforce it at all. So there's absolutely no constraint on Congress passing the buck to agencies. Okay, so, but there is, um, what the court should do is instead recognize the basic principle that Congress is supposed to prescribe the rules and also that there is an impediment to its full enforcement, okay? That would leave members of Congress with a moral and, I think, legally enforceable imperative to shoulder as much responsibility as they can. Instead, of course, they exercise zilch responsibility. Now, here's how the court could prompt Congress to actually do what it should be doing. For it should invoke the constitutional norm that Congress should make the rules as the reason for whatever clarification or modification or limitation of Chevron it, it's for, uh, uh, th th that it wants. I'm not prescribing a particular one right now. And at the same time, it could, should call upon Congress to figure out how it's going to take on more responsibility. And it's absolutely clear that Congress could take on more responsibility. Let me give you a, a leading example. James Landis, who was the New Deal expert on administrative law and then dean of Harvard Law School, proposed that it would be a smart thing if Congress had to vote on major agency actions. Up or down, voted up or down. The agency would write it, Congress would take responsibility one way or the other. Stephen Breyer has shown how this could be made to work in the face of, of gridlock, the gridlock we have, and basically deadlines, limits on debates, no filibuster, so they're gonna, they're gonna have to vote on this stuff, okay? Now, so we have two, de two important Democratic leaders who are for this way of doing it, and Republicans in the House have included the Landis idea in their Reigns Act, you've heard about. 
Now, the RAINS Act has this congressional responsibility built into it in theory, but in fact, what the Republicans have done is put so many poison pills into their bill that it'll never pass. So they get to say, we want to be responsible, but they never have to be responsible because they've designed it so it never can pass. Okay? So, um, if Congress <laughs> fails to step up after a reasonable period of time and informs the public and the court of how it's going to take responsibility, I think this is what the court can do. It could say, okay, in another period of time, one year, two years, whatever, we're going to start saying that major regulations, the kind of regulations that would have to be voted on under Landis Breyer, are not going to take effect, are going to be considered a null and void unless Congress votes on them which would get Congress off the hot seat. So Congress would have an opportunity to figure out how to take responsibility, but in the end, they're going to have to do it for the major regulations, and there are really not that many of them. There are about as many of these major regulations per year, per year as votes on naming post offices and the like. They can do it. Chevron provides an opportunity to get it done by, in, in the reframing of Chevron. Great. Well, thank you so much to each of the panelists for all of your insight. I want to give you all a chance to respond to each other. It sounds like there's a lot of agreement that Congress, in practicality, is broadly delegating authority. I think David Doniger's remarks suggest perhaps that's beneficial because administrative agencies can then efficiently regulate within the broad delegation. Kristen suggests this is inevitable. The delegation's happening. When that's happening, it's going to be better for the agencies who have the expertise to interpret within the delegation rather than the court trying to step in and and regulate where it where it can't maybe you disagree with that that interpretation remark so i'll let you i'll let you respond but mark is coming in and just saying in general there's a due process problem anytime we're giving government really deference at all and this is the opposite of how we um, normally give burdens of proof in in statutory interpretation questions and so why are we going pro-government all the time in these agency cases and so i want to give you all a chance to respond to i guess now me or each other uh in your kind of second round here so Kristen, what, did, what are your thoughts on Mark's due process concerns and some of the other comments? Right? Well, I was going to say, first off, let me make clear. I, it's not that I think that delegation is inevitable. I just think so long as you have delegation, deference is inevitable. Um, you know, but uh, because I'm not convinced that delegation fundamentally, at least not to the extent that we have it now, is is, is inevitable at all. Um, you know, I agree wholeheartedly with David Schoenbrod that the nature, scope, and frequency of delegations has changed and, you know, that not for the better and that at least some of that is reversible. And, you know, that shift in delegation occurred before Chevron did. Chevron's the response to that trend um, not the instigator of it. Doctrinally, I also think David's right about this, uh, that you'd be better, better off pushing for a more robust non-delegation doctrine. Unlike David Doniger, I don't really have a problem with the major questions limitation on Chevron's scope. Um, I recognize it's hard to know what's a major question versus a minor one. Just like in City of Arlington, um, Justice Scalia suggested it's hard to know a jurisdictional question from a non-jurisdictional one, although he then, I noticed, proceeded to list a whole bunch of jurisdictional questions that the Supreme Court had previously um, labeled as being jurisdictional. So um, just because something's hard doesn't mean that we shouldn't try. Um, but to me, some of this debate seems to come down to the meaning of the word deference. Um, does deference mean abdication in the sense of deciding in favor of the government, even where a private litigant has the better argument about what the statute means? Or does deference mean exercising independent judgment up to the point where a judge recognizes that she's done all she can as a judge and all she's left with is the policy-making sphere. Now, obviously, those are two ends of a continuum and not a binary proposition. Uh, but I would posit that with the exception of some obvious outliers, uh, Chevron is at least closer to the independent judgment end of the scale. Um, some judges will get to that threshold of perceiving ambiguity in policy making sooner than others. 
but you have that without deference doctrine, as evidenced by all of the split decisions uh, where you don't have deference doctrine applying at all, um, arguing over whether or not statutory text is sufficiently ambiguous to apply the rule of lenity or the constitutional avoidance canon or turn to legislative history or whatever you do when you decide text isn't clear. I'm not afraid of getting rid of Chevron. Um, I don't think the world would come to an end if we got rid of it. I just think that judge, judicial decision making would be less transparent. Um, and I also don't think it'll do, getting rid of Chevron would make a whit of difference in reigning in the administrative state. Okay, and so, Mark, your your response. I mean, is is getting rid of is Kristen right? Is getting rid of Chevron would not have a would not have an impact on the administrative state? Um, and also, are you arguing for um, should statutes really be giving no discretion to agencies? And when we do have these broad terms like fair and necessary, as a practical matter, right now, how should courts be responding to those broad terms? Well, sometimes the courts should kick the broad terms back to Congress. I mean, the idea that, for example. The Federal Communications <laughs> Commission is is instructed to uh, to regulate in the public interest. The idea that that's an intelligible principle, I think, is yeah. a stretch, <laughs> <laughs> if I can be generous. Uh, and so I, I, I do think that the, the, the but the debate starts to sort of flow over into the non delegation uh, doctrine uh, area. And and so I think that uh, ideally the Supreme Court would take care of both of those. Uh, issues. I'm pleased to say that the Supreme Court has also granted cert in a case this term has already had oral argument in a case called Gundy versus United States. And without going into too much detail there, what I can tell you is Gundy involved the, the federal sex offender registration statute. What Congress did is it, it, it passed this, uh, in writing the statute, it said, this is what will happen to folks in the future uh, who are, who commit felonies and are incarcerated and so forth. This is how they'll have to register under the statute. As for people who are already incarcerated in jail right now, in federal prison right now, uh, that's up to the Attorney General. So Congress wrote half a law. They, they didn't, uh, they, they just tried to delegate the entire decision making to the Attorney General for people who are already uh, in prison. And I think that even the Supreme Court might blanch at that and say, wait a minute, that's too much of a delegation. There's no intelligible principle there. They might even get rid of the intelligible principle doctrine. That would be fascinating, but I don't, I don't know. Uh, but keep an eye out for that as well. Uh, I did want to say that, uh, and Jen, if I failed to answer one of your questions, please, please come back at me. But I did want to say that I actually agree with David Doniger about uh, the fact that the administration has backed away, or the, I guess you said members of Congress haven't, uh, haven't embraced the, the sort of anti-Chevron legislation that they were embracing during the Obama administration. Mm -hmm. And I would go a step further and say that uh, you see the attorneys in the administration, whether it's uh, in the Solicitor General's office or throughout the Department of Justice, continue to advance Chevron arguments in defense of everything that they do. Because when you're in power, Chevron helps you. And they're in power right now, and so they want it. And so I think that's very short-sighted. But you're absolutely right that that's happening. Uh, and fortunately, it's not up to them as to whether or not Chevron continues to be uh, the law or not, because I think if it were, uh, they would never get rid of it. Uh, but it's up to the Supreme Court to fix its own mess in this case, I think. I, I did want to pose a question to some of the other uh, panelists, which is there's another doctrine. And this is, uh, you know, I think that a lot of the, uh, of the uh, tumult over Chevron uh, grew out of a decision that Justice Gorsuch wrote when he was a judge on the Tenth Circuit and that became a very, uh, uh, they got a lot of public attention when he was being confirmed to the, to the United States Supreme Court. And what uh, then Judge Gorsuch ha had taken issue with was a precedent of the, of the Supreme Court called Brand X. And what the Brand X case says is that, uh, and I'm going to oversimplify a little bit here, but even when a federal court has previously interpreted a statute so that there's an existing federal court interpretation of the statute on the books, that even in that situation, a federal agency can come in, reinterpret the statute differently, and get deference for that interpretation in future litigation. And I just wonder what the panelists think about that. Because to me, at a bare minimum, that has got to go. Well, let me, uh, if you were you done? Yeah. yeah. That's Let me just start with a quick answer to that. I mean, it really depends on whether the prior judicial opinion was grounded in step one or step two. If it was a step one decision, no, the agency uh, ought not to be able to, uh, there's no, 
there's no, there's been a prior decision, there's no ambiguity, so there isn't a basis for asserting uh, the authority to interpret in it, uh, an ambiguous provision. And David, not to interrupt you, but can you just briefly describe for everybody what step one of Chevron is as opposed to step okay. two? Okay. So step, uh, so uh, just, Justice Stevens articulated this when the, when the law is clear and not ambiguous, I'm not going to get the exact words, then the uh, job of the agency, the job of the courts, is to follow the unambiguous intent of Congress. And by which he didn't just mean uh, the statutory text, he, re he referred to the use of all the tools of statutory construction to determine the meaning, which would mean uh, definitions and context and uh, uh, how the statute works. Could it possibly mean <coughs> what, you know, the alternative, could, could alternative meanings possibly work? And then um, I think he was thinking also about legislative history as a source of uh, insight into intent. The second step is, well, if the, if the statute actually is ambiguous, it represents a delegation to the agency to make a decision. And if the agency decides, then the, in my mind, the agency has to uh, assert or the agency has to, to outline, define, a range of reasonable interpretations, and then it gets to pick one if it and it gives reasons. And if its reasons are reasonable in the light of the statute, and sometimes in the light of the policy and factual considerations, then it should get deference. That's where it bleeds over into State Farm. Um, is that yes? Helpful? That's great. And then any further thoughts? Yeah. Um, uh, now it might have been David. I can't remember who. Uh, several people said, "Well, Congress." Uh, the implication is that Congress is lazy and uh, uh, takes the easy way out by delegating things. And that's sort of as a, uh, actually Scalia used to say, well, there's no individual. Who, there's, Congress is not an individual. Congress is the, the is 500 and some odd people and they're clashing interests and, they, and the result is a statute. Uh, so sometimes the choice would be if, if you can't get the consensus to be absolutely clear, then you wouldn't be able to pass anything at all. And that's what I mean by um, uh, grinding the, um, the possibility of responding to, uh, to real problems uh, as it, 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 with the speed that, that is required in a modern world would be ground to a halt. Just take the world of Chevron as we have it. You know, if um, uh, if the statute is ruled to be unclear, get to step two, the uh, agency makes a decision and the uh, court upholds it as reasonable, that's not the end of the matter. If the losers um, in that case can convince the Congress to amend the statute uh, to clarify or to change or to fix, um, then uh, that can happen. It happened in the Lilly Ledbetter case at the beginning of the uh, Obama administration. It actually happened in the Clean Air Act in the case that I lost in the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments partially reversed uh, the Chevron, uh, the, 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 the regulations at issue under Chevron. Not totally, it ended up being a negotiated compromise. The industry got uh, some of the flexibility of the definition which was adopted in that case, but in other circumstances and for bigger sources, uh, they didn't get it. Uh, Congress withdrew it, commanded a more specific outcome. So I think actually the Chevron Doctrine encourages the iterative process um, of legislation, regulation, judicial interpretation, experience, and then further legislation. Um, if, if you have a, a, uh, a, a really broad, a uh, really strong non-delegation doctrine and judges start saying, eh, the 1970 or the 1990 Clean Air Act failed to legislate on this given point, <coughs> um, we'll end up in, uh, stuck in a very, very long period of time because it's very easy to block legislation. <laughs> 
In, in just one quick follow-up question before we go on to David Schoenberg, what, what would you say to the to the response that maybe, you know, the the intention in sort of the constitutional structure and with having Congress be a multi-member body was for there to be this tension that sometimes made it hard to act quickly and and require compromises. Some of that lost if too much authority is delegated over to agencies. Yes, we get efficiency, but maybe maybe that's not the most electorally accountable well, approach. Look, I work on climate change, which may or may not be a popular topic in this body. But one thing I think you can say is even with the degree of delegation we have and the Supreme Court up, having upheld EPA's authority to regulate uh, air pollutants that contribute to climate change, we have not seen efficient uh, and rapid responses. We are, uh, somebody said that the best time to have regulated car carbon dioxide would have been 50 years ago and the second best time is now. But we've been at this for a long time, and none of these doctrines guarantee efficiency uh, and speed, but some of them <laughs> are better at, at guaranteeing gridlock. Okay. Great, thank you. And David Schoenbrunn? Yeah, um, I don't think Congress is lazy. I think the members of Congress work very long hours. Uh, however, very few of them are spent on legislation. And, uh, and, and the advice that, that the parties give the new members of Congress is spend most of your time raising money and greeting constituents and about an hour or two a day legislating, right? Now, when they do legislate, they're opp opportunistic. So they figure out how to write a statute so that they simultaneously tell the people who care about, let's say, public health that... Um, this statute's going to protect your health, and they tell the industry, this statute's going to not put much cost on you, right? And I remember John, remember John Quarles? Mm -hmm. First, I guess, first general counsel of EPA, he testified once to Congress that Congress likes to kiss both sides of the apple. And that's what's going on here. And when Congress legislates in that way, it creates polarization, and polarization helps to create gridlock. I would now, say it reflects polarization. Well, I think it's both, okay? But let, I want to get on to this point, that the landis Breyer idea, I think, is a way out of that because it would force them to vote. Now, once they're, no, up or down, okay? And, 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 and if people vote against pro-public health stuff, they're going to take a hit like the Republicans did at some points in the 90s. Now, the point is, once they have to be responsible for both the degree to which the laws don't protect health and the degrees to which the laws impose costs, then they become interested in getting more bang for the buck. Then, they, then things like carbon taxes or cap and trade become more attractive. So if we want to get iteration in the process, we need to make these elected officials accountable to the government. Great. Thank you very much. So I, we have about 15 <clears throat> to 20 minutes left in the panel discussion. And so love to open it up to audience questions. I see that we have some microphones here. So if anybody has a question, if you can come down one of the aisles to a microphone and state your name and affiliation and, and brief question. Um, While we're waiting for people to get to the microphone, can I just make one comment about the broad, the Brand X point that Mark oh, sure. raised? Yes. Just really quickly. Um, I think Brand X is an issue, but not in the rulemaking context. I think it's more of an issue when you're talking about formal adjudications. And that's the Gutierrez-Brizuela problem that uh, Justice Gorsuch mentioned when he was at the Tenth Circuit. You know, Because it was an administrative judge decision. Right. It was a, it was a Board of Immigration me, Appeals decision. Immigration judge yeah. Decision. Um, you know, as, as David points out, you know, if with rulemaking, if a statute's clear, Brand X doesn't kick in. It only kicks in when you've got an ambiguous statute, and then the agency is only going to be able to adopt a contrary interpretation if it's gone through notice and comment rulemaking, not only getting public participation, but also because of State Farm articulating why it thinks the interpretation it wants to adopt is better from a policy perspective than the interpretation that the court adopted. With adjudication, though, Number one, you are more in the realm of more common law interpretation than you are, say, with rulemaking, oftentimes. But number two, you have precisely the due process notice issue that I know that, that, that you're concerned about and that, that we all should be concerned about. Brand X changed the equation in the adjudication context. 
and really deserves some critical thinking. Um, and to foreshadow, I'm working on an article about it. But um, <laughs> in any event, but it's, it, it is very much, I think that's a distinction you have to make, though, about brand X between rulemaking versus adjudication. Well, I have a rulemaking right. to share with you later. But. Great. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, John Murdoch, I'm a recovering law professor and bureaucrat. And I um, want to talk a little bit about our deference, which is sometimes called the, the cousin of Chevron deference, but it can seem to be a bit of an inbred cousin. Um, <laughs> it seems the expertise rationale for it doesn't exist because we have, these are the experts that are making the, the regulations. And so I'm curious, why, why do we want to give agencies an incentive to be vague, uh, why not give them an incentive to write better regulations? And so that's sort of my comment. And, and then the, the question is, given that, what are the merits and the chances of a result coming out of this of Chevron yes, our no, and that's the world we end up in in a few years? Okay, great. Anybody want to take that? The, what's the drawback of our deference and is it likely to go down in Kaiser? Yeah. You wrote the brief. Yeah, well, I, I, I do think it's likely to go down. I think what's particularly telling about the cert grant in that case is that there were two separate questions uh, presented for the court uh, that they could have granted cert on. And one of them had to do with uh, whether or not there's a, a special uh, consideration for veterans in deciding veterans benefits questions uh, and whether whether the court below had, had uh, violated that sort of canon of construction. Uh, in reaching its decision. The court did not grant cert on that question. It only granted cert on the question of whether or not to overturn our deference. And I think that that tells you that there are at least four votes for overturning our deference. And whether or not there's a fifth one, I think, is the open question. But I'll be a little bit surprised if our deference doesn't go down uh, this term. But could you, could you not, uh, I, I say it in, in more positive terms, I, I think there's a difference between our and Chevron it's as you suggested that that um, uh, the agency is, uh, should shouldn't ha shouldn't have the incentive to write vague rules and shouldn't have the latitude to exploit uh, vagueness, particularly when in the course of, well they have the authority to make a timely uh, change through rulemaking. Uh, now, uh, quite often, our deference works against us. Uh, you know our policy. Um, uh, objectives. We find the uh, agencies trying to blunt the the, um, uh, the clarity of regulations by uh, asserting vagueness that I would say isn't there. Well, it would be harder for them to do that if they had to rewrite the regulation to make it less uh, in, uh, effective, uh, from my point of view. Then, then, uh, so we don't necessarily have the same interests. Uh, in the hour situation as in Chevron. And I don't think the, uh, the same paralysis con uh, consequences um, weigh, uh, they don't weigh as heavily. Thank you. Yes. Hi, uh, Jeff Turley. Uh, thanks very much to Professor Mascot and the panel. Uh, my question was about uh, how Chevron, I guess, fits within the broader constitutional scheme and the uh, thought maybe from the uh, then Judge Kavanaugh uh, decision or opinion about a replacement for Chevron. Um, if administrative agencies are thought of as part of the Article II power, which I don't know where else they would fall, then Chevron They're not in the Constitution. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, Chevron deference is um, consistent with deference to the executive branch more generally and to the chief executive, um, almost an application of like uh, Youngstown president within his greatest sphere of power. So I know uh, Justice Kavanaugh, at least if, as reported, is sort of uh, his jurisprudence is sympathetic to broad executive power, but not sympathetic to Chevron deference. But uh, I guess if anyone could uh, try to explain whether there's any tension there. And, and I will say, I think there was one uh, then Judge Kavanaugh uh, opinion in the DC on bond rehearing of Albiani, uh, which was a, a military detention case where he cited Chevron as supporting the uh, power of military detention, at least as I understood it. Well, uh, I'm not a, uh, I don't have a cosmic grasp of the jurisprudence of Judge Kavanaugh, but I've been on the wrong end of it a couple of times. And uh, I don't think he's consistent. I think he's opportunistic and uh, 
in his interpretations. Um, again, in the area of climate change, um, there is a case that has never been decided over the Clean Power Plan in which, in oral argument on bank, he um, expressed skepticism along the lines that basically this, this was a policy question too big for Congress to have delegated to the agency. And I think um, you can make climate change sound like a big, uh, a huge policy decision, but individual instances of regulating power plants, for example, the question how big of a deal it is is a factual one. And, and, and as has turned out, um, uh, while the, the petitioners in that case were arguing that the world would come to an end if the if the regulation went into effect, the actual behavior of the power industry since the regulation was stayed has been to reduce their emissions along the same pathway that the regulation would have required. In other words, it would have been no big deal compared to the uh, business as usual status quo. Um, and yet he would have elevated this question from a regular question deserving deference to one that was a failure uh, to, uh, a delegation failure, uh, simply because he took a view of the, f uh, of the facts, uh, which I think was wrong. Uh, we had another decision, uh, which I sometimes think was an outtake of his, what would have been dissent in, the, uh, in that power plant case, where he ruled against uh, us in a case over the regulation of uh, chemicals called HFCs. And <laughs> I've talked to lots and lots of neutral observers of this, and no one thought that statute was uh, unambiguously preclusive of what EPA did. I can't find anybody who thinks that, other than he, he and Janice Rogers Brown. And, um, uh, you know, it's, so I, I just don't find, uh, and, and Kavanaugh himself in his book review, uh, in the Harvard Law Review, basically kind of admits that he, he his best reading doctrine is, is um, very, um, uh, will, will lead to quirky results or inconsistent results from judge to judge. So, so I very worrisome. I, I think with Judge Kavanaugh's jurisprudence, you had asked about executive power and is there inconsistency. I think sometimes there hasn't been, I, I think it depends on how you're viewing him as having a view of broad executive power. I mean, he certainly thinks that there should be strong executive control over administrative agencies. I think that's a different question, perhaps, than what share of the tripartite amount of federal authority should go to the executive branch. And on those questions, I don't think he, he actually has necessarily held for as broad of a view of executive power as some might might think when they're thinking about instead the vertical question of the, of the unitary executive. And then on the major questions point, just because David Doniger had, had brought this up a little bit before, I think what he's, my read of his case is there, and we, you know, we'll see, we don't know obviously because, you know, we, we don't have the, the new Supreme Court decisions yet, and I don't know how much um, appetite there would be on the court to take these questions on uh, more deeply. But I think, um, I, I read him more to be saying that if there's a massive ambiguity, that it's better to just kick it back to Congress because of electoral accountability rather than assuming that um, the agency has the authority to, to step in. But um, I guess we'll let you have a chance to ask your question now. Well. Hi, my name's Eric Higgins. I'm a student at Scalia Law School. I had a pressure, uh, question for uh, Professor Schoenbrod. You had mentioned that the RAINS Act had some points and bills in it. I was wondering if you could explain those as well as explain what is uh, the most basic requirements uh, for the RAINS Act to be uh, an effective uh, piece. Uh, okay. Um, the poison pills in the RAINS Act, well, there's a lot of them. One of them is that it's framed in a way that suggests it only applies to regulations that are coming into effect, not, in, not to deregulations, huh? I mean, it seems to me if Congress is supposed to be responsible, it ought to be a two-way street. Number one. Number two, it says that all existing regulations uh, shall cease to be a, uh, in effect 10 years from now unless Congress separately enacts them and there could be amendments. Now, you know, you take the whole code of federal regulations, they're all going to have to be enacted in 10 years and they could be done piecemeal with amendments. It can't happen. It's essentially the same way 
Same thing as um, basically just getting rid of the existing Code of Federal Regulations, but nobody is going to know what's going to come in its place. It would create massive uncertainty, both for people who want regulatory protection and for the, for the uh, economy. It would be suicidal. It's nuts. I mean, these, this statute was not written with a view towards it's going into effect. It's, it was written with a view towards um, you know, how it would look. Here's another example. The clean, uh, and now that, while the Clean Air Act says, okay, you're going to have your health protected, and by the way, the agency will be responsible for the costs, well, the RAINS Act says costs of regulation are going to be held const constant, and agencies are going to be responsible for reducing regulatory protection to the extent necessary. I mean, that's kissing both sides of the apple from different parties. It's crazy. It just was not meant to go into effect. Now, there's more stuff like that, um, but the, the point is that you could have, an, a, a, the core of the Landis Breyer idea is workable. Uh, it, as I say, it would, if applied only to major regulations, there wouldn't be too many votes. Uh, the members of Congress could vote upon uh, the basis of the agency record. Um, the, yes, the members of Congress personally will not read the regulations, nor will their constituents, but if some bad things happen to a constituent because of what the member of Congress voted on, their opponent in some future election is going to point it out, so they're going to be scared, so they're going to be paying attention. So the idea that any one party is going to always vote knee-jerk, I don't think is true, because they're going to be fearful of what's going to, I mean, it's, it's votes on rules that make legislators accountable. It's not sound bites. It's not saying I'm for clean air or I'm for the economy. It's voting on the trade offs. That's what's going to make them accountable. And um, my website for my book has a, a, a lengthy, uh, if you could, the, the guy at the laptop could put it up there. The last slide of mine is the web, part of my website that, that has a, specification of what I think ought to go into the bill. Anyway, if you can't put the slide up there, just go to dc-confidential.org, DC and at that website, I have a lengthy explanation of how to write the bill in a way that I think makes sense. Thank you, David. Does anybody else have any thoughts on the RAINS Act before we take our final question? <laughs> um, I just find it, uh, uh, it was a recipe for a lobbying, you know, for lobbying and campaign contributions to influence votes, most of which, even if there are only a few of them each year, would be below the electoral radar. So I think you would not see the accountability that David uh, is talking about. It's very hard to explain uh, most of these votes in, a, in a, uh, an electoral context. Well, let me just, yeah. oh, go ahead. Yes, can we, yes. Thanks for this panel. I'm not a lawyer, so I'm going to slightly change the subject. Um, the, uh, I mentioned before that there's been this sort of digital revolution on the executive branch side, and Congress is about 10 years behind. The crisis of legitimacy of democracy is a problem everywhere, including here. The irony right now, though, is that the executive branch, even though it's more sheltered from the public, Congress is accountable every week when the members go back to their districts, it still has more of a process for engagement uh, outside of elections than Congress does. Like, so we're seeing sort of the petition sites and the social media noise trying to make up for this, but it can't um, because it's such a blunt object in the process of lawmaking. Um, my question for you would be, if we were to mimic sort of a notice and comment process for Congress, and embed it in the committee process, for example, which is the closest thing, and make it more participatory, and decentralize it when we have a secure system and, and available access to data, who could be that curator? Who could be the more decentralized, participatory interlocutor for Congress when it comes to legitimizing it, bringing a political constituency along with it that's competitive, and that restores its informed deliberative process. Because one thing we haven't mentioned here is that uh, hearings themselves are down 70 to 50% in some cases, and a lot of that's on the legislative side, the legislative hearings, and a lot of that's gone into the appropriations process where it really shouldn't be. It's not their job 
to do the brainstorming around policymaking and have this inclusive discussion with the broader public. So who could that be? Would that be the university system, district offices? Great. So, Kristen? You know, it, it, it's, it's interesting the way you frame the question because I don't know that I view, it, it, A, I think of the um, notice and comment rulemaking process as a second best proxy to the legislative process because that's what it was sort of modeled after in some sense. But number two, um, I, I, I don't think that a lack of a curator and a lack of a no, an opportunity for public comment is really what's driving a paucity of he legislative hearings, that's more a function, I would think, of congressional priorities. Uh, you know, if they want to have hearings, they can have hearings. If they want to, you know, if, if nothing else, you know, there's nothing stopping people from calling in or, or sending emails to their members of Congress to register their views. Um, when it comes to informed information, you know, as, as I think was observed this morning, or maybe it was at lunchtime, um, there's nothing stopping members from Congress from reaching out to, to the experts that they want to talk to. I mean, one of the things about being at a university is the number of my colleagues who get called to go testify in front of Congress about this, that, or the other area in which they happen to have expertise. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think turning over that aspect of the legislative process to some other curator actually accomplishes anything. So we are actually at time, but I know, I mean, this is a great discussion, and I'm very <laughs> thankful to the panelists, a lot of insight and the discussion about Congress's role in legislating and how the administrative agencies respond and whether there's prospect for change on the horizon. I'm sure the panelists will be around to answer questions and give more insights if you all would like to come up and talk to everybody. But thank you so much for, thank you so much for being here and thank you to the panelists.